The Supreme Court did a bunch of stuff at once, let's talk about it, including the overturning of the Chevron precedent, which takes power away from federal agencies to assess environmental and public health hazards, and lets the courts decide, which will be really interesting at our next oil spill. But aside from that, the one that fills me with the most anger and fear is that cities can decide to persecute people for publicly camping or sleeping in public spaces, which, you know, essentially criminalizes homelessness and is particularly scary and it also just kind of shows how many legislatures would sooner put money into arresting and forcibly removing the unhoused instead of just like putting money into helping them but additionally everyone should already be considering what this means for protesting because this means that all of those established encampments for palestine could be illegal and this is part of a horrifying pattern of potential criminalization of various forms of protest like mask bans which will most directly impact disabled people but in my opinion the mask ban is very much conceived because protesters figured out that they should be wearing masks for their safety and anonymity. Do y'all remember the animated movie called A Bug's Life that came out in 1998? The main character of the movie's name is Flick and he's an ant and he's a part of this colony of ants that stack food for these grasshoppers that come only once a year. Somewhere along the way in the movie, Flick messes up the food and the grasshoppers are upset. So much so that they threaten the ants and the ant colony, like pretty much run us our food. So Flick goes on an adventure. He goes out into the city to see if he could recruit some people to help to fight against these grasshoppers. He ends up bringing back some other insects that he found in the city that were really a circus troop and, and weren't really about that life. But in the process, he and the rest of the colony recognize that there was more of them than there were of the grasshoppers that all that the grasshoppers had were imitation tactics, threats of violence, the appearance that they were bigger and more menacing. So when the grasshoppers initially demanded that they provide more food and added tax on top of it, and the ant colony recognized, wait a minute, there's way more of us than there is of y'all. Well, the movie is a literal metaphor for colonialism. And what we are seeing from the youth in Kenya is that colony, that community, that understands that there are strengths in numbers. Kenya's finance bill is a strong arm of the people. It would tax people heavily on basic everyday necessities like bread, sugar, and even sanitary products and diapers. And the Kenya said, nah, we not gonna accept that. And because there's more of us than there are of y'all, Let me get this. Let me get this straight, dumbass! You have a fully reloaded shotgun. stop with the stolen land slash land back nonsense we're getting absolutely tired of it it's thinly veiled ethno-nationalism and it's just objectively false it is quite literally an impossibility for all of this land to have been stolen because all of it couldn't have been owned could any of you possibly explain to me how all of this land was owned hey, aloha so the very idea that you think that land ownership is something of ownership is where you're already fundamentally wrong you're looking at this through a Western perspective, which skews your mind to think that we actually have to physically own it with paper and money that purchased it. What you're not realizing is all those indigenous people, regardless if they quote unquote use the land, resided on it and saw that land as a living entity and an ancestor. See, we do not own land. We are the caretakers of land. We don't need to own the land because the land owns us. And just because the land wasn't being quote unquote occupied at the very time of some settlement doesn't mean it wasn't used. You have to remember a lot of indigenous people were migratory. They came and went from places. There's reasons why so many farms were stumbled upon and utilized and people just assumed that they were, you know, natural, but realistically they were hand planted by indigenous people. And yes, all of the United States of America was stolen. If it wasn't stolen, it was through trickery and bribe. Indigenous people were lied to and confused. Treaties were broken. 
mass genocides did take place. There's a reason they, they killed all the bison. There's a reason they burned cornfields and squash fields because once they took away those foods, they controlled the people. See what happened here? This was by design. This was to control a mass amount of people. There's a reason that fry bread is so common across the native tribes because fi fry bread was one of the few commodities that they were able to make through the American handouts of control. There's a reason that spam is so prominent across Hawaii because spam was an object of control. Now when it comes to the land back movement, well, let me educate you. It's not literally about physical land. The land back movement is about a cultural movement of indigeneity. We're asking for our rights back. We're asking for our cultural practices back. We're asking for our language and education practices back. We're asking for indigenous education reform and to not be so controlled by the federal government. We're asking for self-sustainability and methods and ways to become less dependent on capitalistic ideologies. Like so many times people like you see these stolen land and land back and immediately get defensive and fearful. You know, white fragility is legitimately getting the best of you in these times. But honestly, the fact that I have to break all this down for you is pretty pathetic. Like really, bro, you need to do better because you are just perpetuating stereotypes of blatant ignorance. Because let's face it, land ownership sales made in bad faith shouldn't be recognized as legal binding today. Contracts that the indigenous people couldn't understand shouldn't be legally binding today. Bribing random tribal members and not the actual tribal leaders to selling, to selling their lands should not be law binding today. Murder and mass genocide to acquire lands should also not be law binding. And claiming a land to be terra nullius so that you can acquire it without real evidence should not be law binding. So yeah, man, you might be annoyed and sick of hearing us talk about land back, but you can only imagine how sick we are of having to hear people like you play victim when you are literally reaping the benefits from what your ancestors did. Because yeah, it's pretty tiring watching our lands get desecrated, our people get priced off our lands, our education system perpetuate Eurocentric ideology, our languages not even being taught or being a foreign language, our cultural practices and language being banned until 1978, our cultural dances and customs and clothing being exploited and commodified. Yeah, man, you literally have nothing to be whining about. Like, literally nothing. If you actually had an ounce of what the hell being tired actually is, you would... <laughs> you probably wouldn't be able to last, man. Because you know what's tiring is being indigenous. We're fighting for our land. We're fighting for our culture. We're fighting for our religious practices. We're fighting for our cultural practices. We're fighting for our retainment of our languages and our culture. We're fighting for our land. We're fighting for our rights. We're fighting for our water supply. Shit, some of us are fighting for our legal recognition. We're fighting for our sovereignty. We're fighting for the true history of America to be told. That's exhausting. Being an indigenous activist is exhausting. Being an indigenous historian is exhausting because we have to sit here and tell the atrocities of America over and over again so that people like you can belittle it and downplay it to nothing more than a joke and something that you're too tired to hear. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, bro. Go educate yourself on the true history of America. Do better. Hey, white women. Some of us are mad at me because I said that white vegetarianism came into U.S. culture through white supremacy. Very closely tied. White supremacy, Dr. Kellogg, and all. Everyone says I need to be a little more clear that not all vegetarians are racists. And so I'm going to be very, very clear. If you are a white person and you are practicing vegetarianism or veganism and you have not studied this, this is the first time you've heard of this or you've heard of this before, but you haven't gone and educated yourself, 
then you have built racism and white supremacy into your everyday life, whether you know it or not. This is one of those things where your intentions don't matter at all. It's about your impact. If you want a place to get started, Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina, Dr. Sabrina Strings is excellent. Excellent. This book has done more for helping me get rid of my body image issues than anything else. Because at least for me, once I find something is tied to white supremacy, I try really, really, really hard to get it out of my mind and consciousness. So if you're mad at me for this video, maybe go be mad at Dr. Kellogg. Yes, that Kellogg and Seventh Day Adventists and educate yourself on this so you can be rat bad at the right people. Does this mean that you can't be a vegetarian and ant also an anti-racist? No, but if you're a white person and you think that's what you're doing and you don't know the history, you are being a lot more white supremacist than you realize. And I really, really hope you can't live with that. Thanks. Why are Christian mission trips wrong? Within Christianity and outside of Christianity, this is a very controversial topic. In college, I got a minor in Bible and missions. I also am an ex-missionary. We're gonna start here. So there are three main types of Christian missions. We have long-term, short-term, and internships. Short-term missions is the one that gets the most hate. And it's because these trips are anywhere from one to three weeks long. It's usually a group of people anywhere from like 10. Some mission trips have like 60, 70 people. These trips are usually centered around a project, building a house, painting a house, teaching English, growing a VBS. Churches will also say that it really helps their teens get out of their own little bubble. They get to experience different cultures and understand how blessed they are. It's very much so a team building experience. Also, these trips are very expensive. An American church can spend anywhere between like 10,000 to, this sounds crazy, but over $200,000 on mission trips. Some issues I have with these trips is the work that they do is usually done poorly because you can't expect a 15 year old to properly build a home. And what happens is local communities now have to pay to get those mistakes that the Americans made fixed. The intentions aren't bad but the impact is so is the system that you perpetuate when you go on these trips some of the more serious reasons why these trips are very bad is because at a lot of these organizations whether it be like an orphanage a school whatever they have groups every single week throughout the summer coming in and out in and out the americans get there the kids are so happy they leave feeling on top of the world the kids feel sad the attachment abandonment cycle that they experience all summer is not good and because these trips are usually working with children and these churches are bringing a lot of people who might not be good people there's always some sort of harm that is done by the American who's visiting. Next, we have long-term missions. The Mormons are the best well-known example of long-term missionary, but in general, it is someone who's a missionary and in a place for longer than a year. They learn the language, they have training, like the country that they're going to is their home. These are very outreach focused because you're becoming a part of a community. Each year, depending on where they're stationed and depending how many kids that they have, because a lot of long-term missionaries have families, some of them have very large families. A lot of them also live on a compound with other families. Every year, each family will have like a cost that they need to raise. A lot of them also have of like a house cleaner and a security person. So in Thailand, a family could probably get away with living on like $30,000 for a year. But if they're going to the Netherlands, it's gonna cost them a lot more. The biggest issue is the power dynamic. Long-term missionaries are going into these places where they believe that they can help and save these people. And when you go into anything with that mindset, whether it be mission work or social work or whatever, there is a power dynamic there because you're the one who has the tools and they're the ones who do not. Which means a lot of people will convert to Christianity just because they need the Westerners tools, like they need food, they need water. Also the people who are usually partaking in modern day colonization. They also go into these countries and they very much so push Western individualism. They're pushing things like capitalism and all of their Western things that they value. They're trying to put on these cultures. And not only that, because these missionaries have a lot of power, they are associating like godliness and correct theology with the Americans. Also within long-term missions, because they have all the tools and resources, they are sometimes tasked with doing things that they are not qualified to do. We have long-term short term and we also have internships these are our ywams the world race surfing the nations organizations target young adults and teenagers it's kind of like this gap year thing they get them when they're just feeling a little restless because these internships are usually like education based like they're learning about the bible they're learning how to convert people they're learning about different cultures so that they can convert people they're creating very intense environments for people to train for the mission field they're kind of being so because these programs are longer, they usually cost a lot of money. So like some people might pay $5,000, but like the world race for the year, they raise like 20,000. I think it's even more than that. 
There also is an entire industry, like economy behind missions. Um, some of these places are profiting and even if they're not directly profiting, they might be profiting off of like the real estate that they were able to buy with donations. So if fulfilling the Great Commission means going on mission trips, why are all the Christians who are not from the West not going on mission trips all over the world? Mission trips are a Western thing. For my autistic audience.